All righty then. Okay. All right. I just got a text message. All right. All right, here. Guys, we'll wait a few more minutes, but I'm going to play some Assyrian music. Don't hate. This is Assyrian. I love this. Are you Assyrian? This is Tony Gabriel and Tony Adichie. Right. What's your name? You okay with the background? I love this band. You guys got to admit, man, I can. I got some moves, baby. I hope you don't mind the background. Again, just a reminder, <clears throat> I'm at my brother's house. Pray for him. He's my oldest brother. We'll call him Art. Pray for him, his family, and his graciousness and his love for me. He's allowing me to stay here until I find my own place. Pray that within the month I find a place. My other brother's going to join me, but in December, in Jesus' name, pray for the provisions that the Lord Jesus will sustain me and provide through me for my daughters to take care of them. Pray the Lord Jesus to give me favor in this state and plants me here so I remain here for the foreseeable future in Jesus' name and go nowhere, right? Only time I leave is to travel to teach and come back. So please, I need your prayers because, again, I'm not completely out of the woodwork, but we trust the Lord Jesus. He brought me here for a reason. He's going to keep me here for his glory. Amen? Amen? So by the grace of God, first and last, you just sent me a text message. I did, I didn't know you. Yeah, you're busting out laughing on that, right? And I just again want to take a moment because again, I'm not settled yet, and I'm not able to respond to all my brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ who, and their love for Jesus, are partnering with me not just prayerfully but financially via Patreon. <clears throat> you know who you are. I got some additional su supporters is that the word patreon supporters and also some gifts that came in i just want to thank you you know who you are i don't want to mention any particular individual because all of you are precious all of you are a blessing no matter the amount whether a dollar five, doesn't matter every penny helps for us to do the work of the lord jesus you know who you are and jesus knows who you are and i beg the lord jesus to bless you for loving me, his servant, enough to stand with me. God bless you tremendously. May the triumph God bless you tremendously. Because again, <clears throat> we're in full-time ministry, trusting the grace of the Lord Jesus to stir up hearts to provide, because we're not here to do to become rich like Joel Olstein. We want to be spiritually rich and store up treasures in heaven and make sure we have our daily bread until the Lord calls us home. So thank you guys, right? Love you guys. So now make sure to pray for the internet connection yesterday. Man, do we have problems. We had problems yesterday, didn't we? And you see, again, it's a different time that I'm on because I have to take advantage. When the house is empty, the home is empty, there's nobody here now, so I got it for at least an hour and two because, like I said, it's not my home. 
Folks, I can just share this with you. For the past two years, the Lord Jesus in his love and mercy has stretched me, sanctified me, purged me by the power of the Holy Spirit so I can trust in the Lord Jesus, depend on him, trust in him, love him more passionately, more perfectly, right? Because the past two years, I've been pretty much like a stranger sojourning in a strange land. But God is good. Amen? It's okay, Medic. It will be archived. So thank you for passing it on, Medic. Keep passing on the YouTube channel, the articles, so people can eat up the stuff and use it for the glory of Jesus Christ. So let me just ask the Lord to bless us. We love you, Father. <clears throat> we love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Father, sanctify us by your Spirit. Purify us in the holy blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus Christ, your heart become flesh, your beloved son, who made peace by the blood of his cross, reconciling us to you, Father. Father, I ask that you crucify our flesh and mortify our flesh and give us power from your Holy Spirit to walk in the life of the Spirit and the power of the Spirit filled with fruit of the Holy Spirit to become more like the Lord Jesus and the way we love you, we worship you, live for you and the way we love one another the way we think and the way we speak and the way we act, Father. More like Jesus, less like the world, less like the flesh until we're completely freed from the flesh, Father. Anoint the words of my mouth. Enable me by your spirit to recall scripture perfectly, interpret scripture perfectly, proclaim scripture passionately with fire and passion from your spirit. Bless your people, Father. Fill them with wisdom and knowledge and insight from your spirit to understand the things of scripture and father save us from attacks of the enemy enemy bless the internet connection to stay strong for the glory of jesus for the majesty and might of jesus that he'll be glorified your son our god our lord our love our life and save us father father from the world save us from the influence of satan save us from our flesh and save our loved ones save my angels my two daughters whom you love more than i can imagine keep us together and bring them to me and bless them, Father, over abundantly. Cover them, cover us with the blood of Jesus. Seal them, seal us with your spirit. And please, Lord, fill my lungs and my chest and throat with health from your spirit, with the breath of life. Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants, Father. And save me from stammering and confusion. Have your way, have your way, have your way, Father. And bless this YouTube channel and also <clears throat> the websites, Lord where my articles are found, that you'll be pleased to use this material to glorify your son, that Jesus Christ will increase in us and we will decrease and that we'll be more like him in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for hearing us. And please, Father, grant me that desire of my heart that I've asked you for today. Grant it to me, please, Lord, I beg you. In Jesus' name we pray. Yehovah, Father, Son, Spirit. Yehovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yehovah Rapha, Yehovah Rapha, Yehovah Rapha. Father, Spirit. Right? Okay. I just want to finish <clears throat> some loose ends from yesterday's session. You saw because the internet was so bad, I lost connection twice. But glory to Jesus Christ, I was able to cover all the main points. In fact, all of the points by the grace of God's Spirit, you know, for the glory of Jesus. So now... You have several sessions in which I address the role of women in ministry. Go back, re-listen to these sessions, take down notes, ask the Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth and save you from any mistakes I made and to correct those mistakes in me, not to repeat them, but to be changed, to think God's thoughts after them and to live the truths for the glory of Jesus. Amen. That's our prayer, right? That's what we hope for. They tell me that CP is on. CP and David Wood, may God bless them tremendously. Every time they go live, they get about a 1,000. And I can't even get 200 <laughs> in time in Jesus' name. we got to make sure this channel takes off for the glory of Christ. And if you're wondering why I keep thinking about the numbers, it's because I want more people. Now let me qualify. More people who are open to hear what I have to say, study the arguments, prayerfully ask the Spirit to tell them where I'm wrong, where I'm right so that they can then take this material and spread it for the glory of Jesus Christ. That's why. Wow, 12,000, huh? Good to see you, Andrew. Good to see every one of you. Thank you, Robin. Keep asking the Lord to help me to get healthier and holier and that the Lord Jesus will fight my battles. Pray for miraculous favor here to turn the hearts of the powers that be towards me 
and to work with me. I need your miraculous. I need a miracle. I need prayers and fasting to invoke the Lord for miracles, right? Yeah, CP is my brother in the Lord. All right, Michala. I, I keep forgetting whether you are a brother or sister, Mich Michiela. You told me how, anyway. All right. And thank the admins for serving us, serving me to serve you for the glory of Jesus, to maintain order. And thank Protestant Believer for posting verses. And you saw how important order, order is, right? You remember yesterday? We were discussing what Paul meant in 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35, and what he did not mean. Did you understand, those of you who were listening last night, <clears throat> that Paul was not saying that women are to be totally silent and just shut up in the church, right? That wasn't his point. I think I provided ample contextual exegetical evidence from the teachings of the scriptures as a whole that women do have roles to play in the local body of believers in the local churches, right? They're not just there to be completely silent and do nothing and say nothing. That isn't Paul's point. We saw what Paul's point was, right? I said last night that the most that 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 35 proves is that married women are to be silent because Paul doesn't address unmarried women, right? And I even showed what the context was. Paul was addressing a situation in which Christians were running amok, speaking out of turn, creating chaos and confusion, and edifying no one. From the prophets who received revelations and prophesied, from those who spoke in tongues out of turn without an interpreter, to married women disrupting the service with their questions. And Paul is saying that God is not a God of disorder or confusion, but a God of peace and wants orderly worship done orderly in the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus. That was Paul's point, right? Is that clear? Did we get all that? I just want to make sure. Therefore, hopefully I won't need to address the issue of women's roles in the church of Jesus Christ. I hope I won't need to address it again because we did several sessions. Go back, re-listen to the sessions. And if you come to a different conclusion, that's between you and the Lord. You don't have to just listen to me. I present what I believe to be the biblical case. Now, obviously, there are Christians who disagree with me and believe that women can assume the role of a bishop slash overseer slash elder, what we call today pastor. I don't believe that's scriptural, and I think you have to do a lot of stretching in order to make the Bible agree with your view. But that's just me. If I'm wrong, the Lord have mercy. And if they're wrong, may the Lord convict them to repent. But it's one of those areas where we can agree to disagree, and it's not damnable heresy. Not every heresy, not, not every wrong view or contrary view will damn you to hell. Make a distinction, right? Those doctrines that if you're wrong will damn you to hell because those doctrines that you embrace show that you're not born of the Spirit. You don't belong to Jesus. You're not walking in the Spirit, right? And then those doctrines that you can hold, even though they may be in error and contrary, but they're not damnable. So let me repeat again. There are doctrines that if you hold to, are damnable, showing that you're not born of the Spirit, you're not walking in the Spirit, unless you repent of those doctrines, because those doctrines hit at the very heart of the Christian faith, who and what God is, what salvation is. But then there are those issues that are not, how do I say, the heart, the backbone of the Christian faith, like whether should we baptize infants or not. And those issues we can agree to disagree, and if... I'm mistaken. I trust the Lord will have mercy and compassion towards me and not damn me to hell for that. If you're mistaken, I believe the same. So just again, I gave you what I believe to be the scriptural position. So don't do what some gentleman did who made the stupid mistake of challenging me in the comment section saying he disagrees. But thank God for him because he raised up 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 35 and 1 Timothy chapter 2, which then afforded me the opportunity to provide what I believe was in-depth exegesis by the grace of God's Spirit on what those passages mean and do not mean. Is that clear now? Now, what I want to do is I want to answer some questions that was asked of me.
concerning the Godhead, concerning the Lord Jesus and other issues. But before I do that, I'm going to give you first dibs. Because I think I've covered that, right? We've covered women's roles in the local body of believers, the local churches of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think we've covered that. You can go back and listen to the arguments. And I'll post the links to my articles in the description box in due course, Lord willing. So if you guys have questions, as I trust the Holy Spirit to fill me, to glorify Jesus and bless you, his people. If you want to ask me a question, feel free, and I'll see if I'll take that. Because there is one question in particular that was asked of me on more than one occasion. When you say eternal salvation, I don't know what you mean. Because everyone believes that salvation is eternal. The question is, can you lose the gift of eternal salvation, Scott? So be more specific in what you're asking. And I prefer to use the word everlasting salvation, even though I'm splitting hairs, because by eternal we mean never-ending, incorruptible moral life, right? Okay, now, Michalia, you say you can. I disagree with you, you see? So before you pontificate, Michalia, see what you just did? You just said you can, and I say you're wrong. You can. So don't chime in. And tell me what you believe, because I'm going to tell you what I believe, and there's going to be a debate. You get my point? I know who it is, Christway24. Yeah. No, I don't subscribe to Tulip. No, you're not late. We just started, Jose. So, Michalia, what I'm trying to teach everyone is this. Be a little more humble. Be a little more cautious. Be a little more considerate towards your brothers and sisters in Christ, because this is another issue. Let me just explain. There are two views regarding whether a person born of the Spirit can lose their salvation or whether God will preserve the believer by the power of the Holy Spirit so that person never loses his or her salvation, right? Those are the two views. Historically, and even till now, the majority position is that someone born of the Spirit can lose their salvation. There is a view that says if you're truly born of the Spirit— the Holy Spirit will preserve you and work in you in such a way that you never lose your salvation because your salvation wasn't yours to begin with. It was a gift of God's grace, and he doesn't take it back. Okay? So if you believe you can lose your salvation and someone else believes you can't, that is, again, one of those doctrines that you can agree to disagree because whether you're right or wrong about that issue, it's not damnable. You won't go to hell if you're mistaken. You with me there? You, you with me there? I don't want to give you my opinion. I just want to first make sure you get it. So if Scott believes if you're born of the Spirit, and if you're truly born of the Spirit, God in His infinite power will preserve you and work in you in such a way that you never want to turn away. You may fall for a season, but you'll be convicted to return to the feet of Jesus, and therefore you'll never risk losing your salvation. And someone says, no, you can lose your salvation and then need to be regenerated and saved all over again. If Scott is right and the other position is wrong, the other position doesn't go to hell. If Scott is wrong, he doesn't go to hell. It's one of those issues where you can agree to disagree and still end up in heaven by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Now, I have to honestly admit there is massive amount of scriptural proof that strongly suggests a person can lose his or her salvation. However, I'm still persuaded that those who walk away from the faith never to return, those who fall away from the faith never to return, those who are severed from the grace of Christ are those who were never born of the Spirit and therefore were never kept by the Spirit, so they're... <clears throat> Falling away was proof they did not belong to Jesus Christ. That's my position. I'm not saying my position is the majority position or doesn't have challenges scripturally, exegetically. But that's my position. And if I'm wrong, may the Lord convict me to repent. Yeah. You with me there? That's just my position. As far as Hebrews 6, 4 to 6 is concerned... I don't know. Should I talk about that? We'll see. Let's see. Cheryl, if a widow has children, why wouldn't her children 
support her. Now, if she has no children, then obviously a believing member of the household would have to take care of a family member, whether a widow, whether a mother, what well, you know, it doesn't matter. The principle is if it's someone who is a family member, a fellow believer, born of the spirit, it doesn't matter, widow, father, mother, why, why make that distinction? All right. Anyway, too many good questions that I don't think I want to answer because it's going to entail multiple sessions and it's going to cause more controversy. And I don't care about causing controversy. I don't care. It's just it might require multiple sessions. And I'm trying to find questions where I can answer in one session or even less than a full session. So let me answer Matthew 28, 18, because that came up. Matthew 28, 18. What's your understanding of speaking in tongues regarding an initial gift to verify? No, I don't believe you need to speak in tongues to show that you're born of the Spirit or filled with the Spirit. That's not my belief. That's not my position, and I don't think it's scriptural, Charles. So I hope that answered your question, which I don't think you you wanted me to just answer off the fly and real quickly. Uh, Glenn Adam, notice what you did again. You started pontificating because you assume you understand what Hebrews 6, 4 to 6 means. See what you just did? You just told me what you think it means, assuming that your view of Hebrews 6, 4 to 6 is the correct one, as opposed to seeing whether Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 6, speaks of a hypothetical situation that if this were to happen, then it's impossible to restore a person to salvation, and seeing that in light of what the book of Hebrews teaches as a whole. There's too many verses that refute limited atonement, particular redemption, and there is no verse that proves it. Better question women with... A parasol, can you show me any passage that explicitly, irrefutably establishes Christ died only for the elect? It doesn't exist. It's not there. Yeah. Road FFM. You know what they're going to tell you? Yes. No one can pluck the sheep out of the hands of Christ. But what's to say that the sheep chooses to walk away? You get it? Road? You see what you guys are doing? I want you to see the pattern with every one of you. Every one of you throws a passage that you think supports your position because you haven't studied the other position to refute you. Someone did it with Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 6, and Rode, you did it with John 10, 28. You see the problem with, with you guys? Because you guys are too scared, and I'm going to say it in a nice way. You guys are too scared to listen to the other side because you're afraid the other side may change your position. But why? Why would you be afraid to be corrected and change your position if your position is not biblical? So, Rode, you just, again, refuted yourself because you said those who follow me. So what if a sheep chooses not to follow Christ anymore and walk away? Because this is the same gospel where in John 15, verses 1 to 8, John talks about those who are connected to Christ, that if they prove fruitless, They'll be cut off and burned. And the only ones connected to Christ are those who profess faith in Jesus Christ. Do you see the problem, Road, with taking one passage and telling me what you think it means and ignoring what that passage means in the immediate and overall context of that particular writing? No, Road, you're wrong. See, again, you're going to force me to block you because, again, you're speaking in your ignorance. It says the sheep who follow him. Implication, there'll be sheep who choose not to follow him to prove it to you. If all the sheep follow Christ, why does Christ go look for the lost sheep? You see, stop pontificating, Road. Stop while you're ahead. If every sheep follow Christ, then why is Christ looking for lost sheep? They wouldn't be lost if they're following him. You see your problem? See what you're doing? No, son, it's okay, man. The reason why I hesitated to answer Scott is because of this very issue. Because I knew we're going to have all the chiefs popping up and they're going to forget to be Indians because they're going to start pontificating thinking they know what they're talking about. You get my point? You see the point, Scott, why I hesitated? Because I knew the moment the question is asked, all the chiefs would pop up. Forget their Indians, start pontificating, thinking they know what these passages mean because they never heard the other side presenting all these other passages to challenge their assertion. 
But see, what I've been doing since I got into full-time ministry by the grace of God, I've now, by the grace of God's Spirit, have been open to hear all sides, which is why I know when his he quotes a passage, what the response is to that passage, because I've heard the other side respond to that passage. You see? And if you guys keep listening to only the people you like, you won't be challenged. You won't be convicted. You won't be stretched. You won't be forced to think on a deeper level. And therefore, you're going to be stagnant and you won't grow. Okay. You get my point? So here's what I want to challenge you guys. Thank God for modern technology. Thank God for YouTube. I want you to do a YouTube search. Bible on losing salvation. Bible on eternal security. And you're going to see plethora of videos from both camps. In fact, I'm going to recommend one debate that really humbled. See, I'm going to mention him again. And people are going to think I'm mentioning him again. See, you're forcing me. One debate that utterly humbled James White and knocked him off his horse because it showed him he's not the superstar of reformed apologetics that he thinks he is. James White made the mistake of inviting Trent Horn of Catholic Answers to debate him uh, in, I think it was G3 conference. I think it was in honor of the celebration of the Reformation. And he was very arrogant and proud and snotty. And Trent Horn humbled him and cut him down to size. It was a bad debate for James White. In fact, it was so bad that James White had to do a special dividing line teaching people how to judge debates because if they knew logic and how to judge debates, they would see he won. The arrogance of him. Okay? And I'm actually, I was all for James White's position. But... Trent Horn schooled him. The only time Trent Horn had a difficult time, the only argument that Trent Horn struggled with was John, uh, James' exegesis of John 6.44. But everything else, he hammered White and schooled White and made White look so bad. And I'm being honest. Even Protestants there thought White didn't do good. And it got so bad for White that he had to go after the debate and do a dividing line saying, here's how. You judge a debate and you score a debate. And if you know how to do it, you'd see I won. And people, and he wonders why people cannot stand him because of his arrogance. Right? So if you want to hear both views debated vigorously, listen to the debate. James White, Trent Horn. The problem with winning the debate, Christ the Way 24, is that the assumption is that I want to prove him wrong. Why would I want to prove Trent Horn wrong when I want to hear what he has to say and see whether he's handling the passages correctly? And if so, I'll concede. See, this is the problem about debates. When you enter a debate, you want to win. But then you want to win at the expense of hearing whether the other side is presenting the Bible accurately in opposition to what you think is the biblical view. You see the point? I am not interested in winning debates with people that I believe, let me say this, that I believe are born of the Spirit, are true Christians, even though they may belong to a church that has significant error and false teaching. And so if you are one of those, a Trinitarian, who believes the Bible is inspired, inerrant, infallible, but you belong to a particular Tradition, let's say Catholic, because I'm not James White or other reformers who think there is no one saved who is still a Catholic. Or there is no one saved who still is an Orthodox or subscribes to the tenets of Orthodoxy. I believe you can have someone like a Scott Hahn who passionately believes in the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church and still be saved, even though he's an heir in assuming that all that Rome teaches is correct. And because of that, I don't view him as a Muslim or an anti-Trinitarian heretic, Unitarian of various persuasions. So I'm more open to hear what he has to see, say to see maybe he's seeing something I am not seeing. And if it's true, I want to accept it because I want to be a biblicist.
I don't want to be Protestant. I don't want to be Catholic. I don't want to be Orthodox. I want to be Biblicist, and I mean it from my heart. My prayer, and I'm not putting a show, my prayer before the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, and I pray that you pray this with me, with me, Holy Spirit, we are in love with you because you are our God, our Lord, our Creator, our Maker, our Sustainer, our Life Giver, our Savior, our Preserver, our Provider, our All in All, because you are God, one with the Father and the Son, and you are our perfect teacher. You're the one sent to teach us, instruct us, correct us, discipline us, rebuke us, guide us, transform us. I beg you, let me see what the Bible teaches and enable me to see it the way you see it, the way you want it to be seen, and give me the power to live it out for the glory of Jesus. Please, Holy Spirit, this is my prayer from my heart, and I mean it. That's what I want. The problem with debating, 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 is that your focus now in debating isn't to see maybe your position is wrong and be open to hear to the to be open to hear the other side to see maybe they're right. No, when you debate, you want to destroy the other side. That's why I debate. When I debate someone, it's because I'm convinced they are so wrong, they need, need to be put in their place, they need to be ashamed, they need to be rebuked, they need to be silenced. That's why I debate. Right? You get my point? That's why I debate. No, it doesn't, woman. Don't embarrass yourself with Mark 4, 11 and 12. Please don't embarrass yourself. I'm going to end up embarrassing you. Hold on. Okay? Woman, I'm going to end up embarrassing you for misquoting Mark 4, 10 to 12. Do you want me to end up because you see you're pontificating in your ignorance thinking you know Mark 4, 10, 10 to 12. See, this is why I'm telling you, come here with a humble, gracious attitude. Come here with a humble, gracious attitude and you'll benefit from me. Come here with an arrogant attitude and pontificate. You're going to get embarrassed and humiliated. Do you want me to now show you why what you just did with Mark 4, 10 to 12 is an embarrassment to you and you should be ashamed for misquoting it to prove limited atonement? Okay, guys, let me show you how you can benefit from my YouTube channel. Let me show you. Come here. Here, please listen, because I want to bless you. I want to love you. I want to serve you for the sake of Jesus. I don't want to attack you. I don't want to cause you to stumble. So please learn how you can benefit from this channel. Come here with a humble, gracious, open heart. Hear what I have to say. Take the information. Prayerfully study it. And come to your own conclusion. And if you think I'm wrong, that's okay. But don't come here pontificating, please. Do you want me to show you why you just misinterpreted Mark 4, 10 to 12? And it's not teaching limited atonement. It's teaching God's just retribution. God giving people what they deserve and handing them over to their hardened hearts. Because no matter how much revelation he gives them, their response is to oppose it, to contradict it, to throw it in his face and walk in defiance of his will. And so now God says, you've now reached the point of no return. I'm done with you. Enough is enough. I'm going to hand you over to the hardness of your heart. So that little illumination you had will now be taken away. That's what Jesus is teaching in Mark 4, 10 to 12. No, what do you mean? What's wrong with me? You just quoted Mark 4, 10 to 12 and said it taught limited atonement. So you're not listening and learning or benefiting from me because you won't pontificate, woman. So what's wrong with you? If you've been here, then you know the policy, right? So do you want me to just Mark 4, 10 to 12 right now and show you that you misapplied it? Because the passage in the context of Mark isn't teaching that God deliberately withholds the mysteries of the kingdom of God from those who want to see but have been handed over in spite of their desire to want to believe. Which again, I'm caricaturizing the position. Do you know why Jesus said Mark 4, 10 to 12, why he said what he said? Do you understand Mark 4, 10 to 12? 
Do you understand the context of the parables? Why he started speaking in parables? I'm waiting for a response, woman. Do you know why he started speaking in parables? Okay. Because if you didn't start in Mark 4, but you went to Mark 3, you'll see why. Mark 3, 20 to 21. Let me show you why. No, I'm sorry. Not Mark 3, 20 to 21. Mark 3, 22 to 30. Let's break it down. Mark 3, 22 to 30. Here's why. Jesus started speaking in parables. Glenn, repeat what Andrew Womack did, and I'm going to send you to Colorado. I'm going to block you. Do it again. Mark 3, 22 to 30. Read with me. Here's why. Here's why Jesus started speaking in parables. Woman, listen, learn, so you don't misapply Mark 4, 10 to 12. Let's read it. And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said... He had Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. And he called them unto him and said unto them in parables. Did you catch it? This is the first time Jesus speaks in parables. It's not a coincidence. Here he speaks in parables because of what they said. Pay attention. Right? And he called them unto him and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? And if kingdom be divided against himself... That kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand but half an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sin shall be forgiven unto the sons of men and blasphemies, wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation, because they said he hath an unclean spirit. Woman, did you see why he started speaking in parables? This is the first time Jesus speaks in parables, and it's in response to them blaspheming the Holy Spirit, saying, Jesus cast out demons by an evil, unclean demon. Is my connection good? Is it good? Okay. So, folks, why did Jesus start speaking in parables? Because of their blasphemy, he was done with them. Enough is enough. I put up with the generation... I've sent you prophets. I have sent you signs and wonders. And now I am here in the flesh. And that's how you respond to me. Now you've reached the point of no return. You've now reached a level of reprobation. I'm now going to hand you over to the desires of your heart. And therefore, from now on, I won't speak plainly to you, but in parables, because I'm done with you. How in the world did you take this to show Limited atonement, when in the context, Jesus was teaching them plainly because he desired their salvation, but because of them blaspheming, the Holy Spirit says, that's it, it's over, I'm done. It's done. I'm done with you. Why would you then misapply Mark 4, 10 to 12? In fact, if you read the entire chapter, it even says, even the little that was given to them shall be taken away. In that same chapter, even the little that was given to him shall be taken away. So the reason why Jesus is speaking in parables to the outsiders is because that group has reached the point of no return. They've reached a level of rebellion that God now says, I'm done. I'm fed up. You've now blasphemed the Holy Spirit. There is no second chance. There is no forgiveness. Now I'm going to give you what you want. I'm going to hand you over to the hardness of your heart because now I'm determined to judge and destroy you. Did you listen, women? Because now I'm going to turn it against you. I'm going to turn it because now I'm going to quote a passage that you would never quote because this passage is a nightmare for those who believe in unconditional election and particular redemption. Are you ready? 
Luke 19, 41 to 44. Luke 19, 41 to 44. And woman, I want you to answer this. Luke 19, 41 to 44. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. Woman, pay attention. So I want you to answer this. He wept over the city, pay attention, saying, if thou hadst known, if you had known, even thou, at least in this thy day, if you knew this, your, what your day was, this is your day, the things which belong unto thy peace. If you only realize the things that would bring you peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee around. They will encircle you and make an embankment around you and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee. Why? They shall not leave in thee one stone upon other because thou knewest not, you did not realize, understand, the time of thy visitation. Now, please, for the life of me, reconcile this with unconditional election and particular redemption. Jesus is weeping. This is the human face of God. This is God in the flesh. Weeping, not crocodile tears, because God is not a deceiver. He's not the God of Muhammad. Expressing genuine heartbreak, remorse over people that he came to bring salvation and peace. But because of their obstinate rebellion and disobedience and defiance, they now left him no choice but to destroy the city and the people in it, and it's breaking his heart. Why? If limited atonement is true. If Jesus comes only to save the elect, then the elect will turn to him. But here he's weeping over a people that he wanted to save, give them peace. But because of their rebellion, they leave him no choice but to destroy them, and it's breaking his heart. Woman, go ahead. Reconcile this with your limited atonement. An unconditional election. Go ahead. I'll wait. Go ahead, woman. Why are you silent? Say something. Yes. This shows a more beautiful Jesus, a more compassionate Jesus, a more merciful Jesus, a more glorious, merciful, loving, compassionate, trying God than the other position. Now, just in case you didn't get it, woman, let me tell you what the visitation was all about. Do me a favor, Protestant. Post Luke 19, 44, back to back with Luke 1, 68 and 69. 68 is the key. And verses 76 to 77. So Luke 19, 44. Luke 19, 44. Luke 1, 68 and 69. And 76 to 77. Guys, read back to back. I think the shock made her leave Zina. No one blocked her. I think she got so rocked and shocked, she left. She couldn't handle it. Read with me. Let's see what the visitation is. Guys, pay attention, please. And shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Now, Lord Jesus, what did you mean by visitation? What does this word visitation mean? You don't need to guess. Guys, read with me. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, filled with the Holy Spirit, breaks out in praise. Notice what he says. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Through the tent, Luke 1, 76, 77. Did I say 78, 79? I first said 76, 77. I first said Luke 1, 76, 77. Then I went 78, 79. I apologize. Now put Luke 1, 76 to 77. Pay attention. And thou, child, Zechariah, speaking of a son, John, who had just been born, you, John, my child, shall be called the prophet of the highest. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of sins. Okay, guys, did you catch what Jesus meant by Israel? This was the time of your visitation. You don't need to guess. God came to visit Israel with redemption. 
by raising up a horn, a king, a ruler in the house of David, the Messiah Jesus, to bring salvation and sent John the Baptist to prepare them to accept this horn, this Messiah, this King Jesus, for the forgiveness of their sins. So why did Jesus visit Israel? To save only the elect or all the nation, most of whom rejected him, resulting in Jesus weeping bitterly and then destroying Jerusalem and the people within it because they didn't accept his gift of salvation. You see what happens here? Is it making sense? Luke 19, 41, 44 is a nightmare for someone like James White. He's going to do a tap dance around it, and he'll do another 50,000 Radio Free Genevas on his DL show, saying nothing but giving the semblance that he is refuting all the while, reading his tradition into the passages, distorting the contextual meaning of these passages, and resorting to attacking the person's character. I believe in a perfect saver perfectly saves. Good for you. Let's do exegesis. That's why I pray in Jesus' name. In springtime, I debate this man, and I promise you, I will decimate him like I've never decimated anyone else in Jesus' name. To destroy his arrogance by the grace of God. Oh, yeah. You want me to refute that for Samuel 3.14? If anyone is foolish enough, Charles, to use that against you? You want me to show you how to refute 1 Samuel 3, 13 and 14? To anyone who will misuse that passage. You ready? Okay. I hope you're not one of those who does believe in particular redemption. If so, that's between you and God. We'll agree to disagree. Okay. But let me show you how this passage is also misused. Okay. I have the answer. Okay. You see, she's a joke. It refused nothing. Okay, woman, before I block you and send you to Calvinville, why is Jesus weeping over a people that he's going to destroy if his intention wasn't to save them? See, she's a joke too. And she goes, she's been following me. See, notice how wicked and silly and stupid she is. She feels like this stupid, foolish woman. White is right. You're angry. No, that's passion. But you're a joke, and I just destroyed your man-made tradition. Watch what I'm do to your idol, your God, James White. Did you catch it? You see, it was just a matter of time. She would expose herself for being a worshiper of a man and elevating a tradition that she cannot address because her authority is not scripture. She's a solo Solowitian and a Totowitian, which is why in Jesus' name, I'm going to destroy your idol by the power of the Holy Spirit and humiliate him. But I'll be very gracious when I do it. Yeah, she's a joke. Did you guys catch it? You see how she exposed herself? It refutes nothing. Address it. Why is Jesus weeping over Jerusalem and its inhabitants? For failing to realize that he came to visit them, to redeem them, and now he's left with no choice to destroy them because Jesus, according to your man-made satanic lie, only came to save the elect, and he doesn't need to weep over the elect because the elect will turn to him. Right? And folks, for the record, I'm not angry. And if any of these Solowitians think I am, shame on them. May the Lord Jesus rebuke and chasten them severely. I'm speaking from my passion. Honestly, I'm not angry. You with me there? Now send her on her merry way. Nope. Weeping as he approached Jerusalem. Luke 19, 41 to 44. Yeah. Send her on her merry way. Yeah, white is right. You're an angry person. As if white is the most loving and gracious person. Don't let me start now going on a witch hunt after white, showing all the videos of all the people, whether Reformed Baptists, Reformed Calvinists, Arminians, and traditionalists like Leighton Flowers who document his nasty, filthy, arrogant, ungracious, demeaning attitude towards fellow believers. You wicked hypocrite. You are a solo Wittian and a total Wittian. Anyway, 
You see why Mark 4, 10 and 12 does not support limited atonement and it backfired against her and shamed her, which is why she's angry now. She's going to run to white. Why? Protect me against that big, bald monster, that Ethereum Ninevite. Now I see why Jonah didn't want the Ninevite to be saved. Darn you, Jonah. Why would I need to explain, explain 1 Peter 2.24 in light of limited atonement? Why not explain 2 Peter 2.1 in light of limited atonement, Charles? Let's go to 2 Peter 2.1. Charles, let's see how you're going to do with this one. 2 Peter 2.1. Watch here. 2 Peter 2.1. Why, why, why would I need to? It's there. It's self-explanatory. Jesus bears the punishment, the penalty for our sins, but... <clears throat> The saving benefits of what Christ did are not applied to the person until he or she believes. Accomplishing redemption is not the same thing as redemption being applied or appropriated. So what's the problem? What's the problem? Let me deal with 1 Samuel 3, 13 and 14 because it comes up. Let's deal with it real quickly. And we'll talk about other issues. 1 Peter 3. 13 or 14. White says I'm angry. Yeah, I can see. I'm sorry. I'm losing sleep. I'm so angry. I'm losing sleep. <laughs> okay. First Peter 3, 13. I'm sorry. First Samuel 3, 13 or 14. This is another passage to show you how desperate folk like James White are in trying to wrench the scriptures to support particular redemption. First, cham First Samuel chapter 3, verse 13 or 14. Am I boring you guys? We're still under 100, man. You're breaking my heart. Tell CP to retire and send me his thousand. 1 Samuel 3, 13 and 14. Okay, read with me. 1 Samuel, bro. Protestant, you're killing me. I'm going to lay hands on you and knock you out and repent. 1 Samuel 3, 13 and 14. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows. All right. Okay, let's read it again. 1 Samuel 3, 13 and 14. Okay, let's read it again. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he stained them now. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. Okay, see? Limit atonement. Atonement wasn't applied to Eli and his household. You want me to show you how desperate they are in quoting this passage? And that shows you that when it comes to their tradition, they won't handle the scriptures reverently or with care. And by the way, folks, I used to do that too. I used to believe in particular redemption and resorted to the same mental linguistic gymnastics that James White is forced to resort to when he wants to de defend his man-made tradition. You see verse 14, folks? Does everyone see it? God says he will not make atonement, purge the sin of Eli's household forever. Okay, you, you see it? Does anyone see it? I just want to make sure. Oh, we lost people. We were up to 93. We're down 87. Okay, do you see it? And so they say, see, this proves limited atonement. Not everyone's sins get atoned for. You know why that's a silly objection? You know why that's a silly objection? Number one, Eli was the high priest of Israel. Up until that moment, Eli used to make daily sacrifices and Yearly sacrifices for the atonement of not just the nation, but for he and his household. That means the most that you prove from this passage is that the sins of Eli and his household were being atoned for up until that specific moment when they reached the point of no return. And then from that moment onward, no more atoning sacrifice for them. You understand what you just proved? You actually proved atoning sacrifices were being made for Eli and his household up until that specific point in time. But because the wickedness of his children had reached the breaking point, no more atonement for any more sins from this moment onward. So it doesn't prove that atonement isn't made for everyone. What it proves is atonement won't be applied to anyone, everyone, who engages in willful defiance and disobedience because he or she will be cut off. Do you understand now? 
If you're confused, ask me. Say, I'm still confused. Explain the point again. Because I do repeat myself more than once. So it can sink in by the grace of God. Who didn't understand the point? Anyone didn't understand? Okay. Michali, Eli is the high priest. Up until the moment that God told Samuel to tell Eli, no more atonement for your family forevermore. Up until that moment, Eli was making daily and yearly sacrifices for the nation and his household, which God accepted up until that point in time. So who said God wasn't accepting atoning sacrifices for Eli and his household for a specific period of time? He was. But when his sons had reached the point of reprobation, a point, a level of sin that God would no longer tolerate, from that moment, he says, no more atonement, you're cut off. So how does this prove that atonement isn't made for everyone? It actually proves the opposite. Though atonement is made for everyone, when a person refuses to submit to God and turn to God in sincere repentance, then the atonement won't be applied to that person anymore. Thank you, Scott. Well, then you saw it. Charles, why are you changing my discussion tonight into limited atonement? Why are you doing that? Why would it go against perseverance of the saints? Who says that they were saints to begin with? As part of God's covenant community, atonement would be made for the entire nation, but it would not be applied to the person who refuses to humble himself before the Lord. Cut off meaning that now they're no longer part of God's covenant community. They're severed from God's covenant community and good for nothing but destruction, Rebecca. Don't ask me to pronounce your name correctly. I'm going to call you Michael because I can't. You keep trying to correct the pronunciation. Michael, accept the fact that I'm going to call you Michael. Is that clear now? How does 1 Samuel 3.14 prove atonement isn't made for everyone? In point of fact, Michael, up until the declaration of 1 Samuel 3.14, wasn't Eli making sacrifices of atonement for the nation and himself and his household year after year up until that moment in time? So what this teaches is that though atonement will be made for a person, if that person refuses to humble himself and turn to God, that atoning sacrifice won't be applied to the person, not because he's not included in it, but because of his willful rebellion and disobedience, he or she cuts himself or herself off from the saving benefits of the sacrifice. Glenn Adam, I think you're trying to tempt me, and I think I'm going to bounce you. Who told you that they lost salvation? Do you not get it that atonement was made for the entire nation of Israel, whether born again or not, whether regenerated or unregenerated, but that atoning sacrifice was not accredited or applied or appropriated to those who were sons of Belial, who proved themselves to be unregenerate sons of the devil, Do you want to get bounced too? Because it seems like you're trying to debate me. Is that clear? Everyone got it? Yes, Charles. According to Hebrews 10.4... The reason why the priest would make daily and yearly sacrifices is because those sacrifices provided a temporary covering of sin. It didn't remove sin completely, which is why they had to be repeated. The repetitive nature of the Old Testament sacrificial system was proof. It didn't remove sin. It covered them. So that means, Charles, if you're living under the Old Testament theocracy, you could have your sins covered for that year, but not next year. You with me there, Charles? Okay. 
So I'm now using the context of the Old Testament to understand 1 Samuel 3.14. You can't read 1 Samuel 3.14 in light of the New Testament when you now have a more fuller revelation. Now you have the complete perfect revelation that helps us understand the Old Testament better. You must understand 1 Samuel 3.14 in its immediate historical context. And from that perspective, atonement was made to provide temporary covering for the sins of Eli and his household up until that point where God said, I'm fed up. Now I'm going to cut you off and your household indefinitely. So you see the dishonesty, Charles, of trying to take 1 Samuel 3.14 and interpret it in light of the New Testament revelation. Because when Samuel said those words, and 1 Samuel recorded those words, there was no New Testament, there was no book of Hebrews to explicate, to help us understand how the Old Testament sacrificial system could not remove sin completely, which is why it had to be repeated over and over again, because all it could do was provide temporary covering of the sins committed at that time and needed to be repeated for all other sins committed afterwards. You with my point? You see my point? So now if I interpret for Samuel 3, 14 in light of its historical context, then you have just established, Charles, that atoning sacrifices were made for Eli and his sons and did cover them daily and yearly up until that point in time. And from that point onwards, no more covering because now I'm going to cut you off permanently. You get my point now? So I'm interpreting it in light of its Old Testament context. It is simply dishonest and shows how desperate these folks are to want to take 1 Samuel 3.14 and read in light of the New Testament when that statement was made at a specific time without the further revelation and illumination of the New Testament. So instead of trying to sandwich this passage in the New Testament, tell me what it would have meant for the people hearing it at that time in that context. Yes, Charles. You get my point now? Does everyone understand the dishonesty of appealing to 1 Samuel 3.14 to try to prove limited atonement with the hindsight of the New Testament revelation? You understand? What you're learning in these sessions, and I'm trusting the Holy Spirit is filling me and protecting me and correcting me and sanctifying me to interpret Scripture correctly for the glory of Jesus and then live it out, all of us, for the glory of Christ and love of Jesus and one another. What you're learning is how to interpret scripture and how not to interpret scripture. Again, let me repeat. I'm going to sound like a broken record. I'm going to sound like a broken record. When God told Samuel to utter those words to Eli in 1 Samuel 3.14, did they have the New Testament? Did they have the death of Christ? Did they have the book of Hebrews to now fully explain the Old Testament sacrificial system telling us that those sacrifices did not remove sin. It only covered sin temporarily. In other words, if I was living at the time of Eli and Samuel, would I have thought that the sacrifices only covered my sin and not remove them? Exactly, Prof. 2. From the vantage point of the Old Testament, would I have thought these sacrifices only cover my sin, but didn't remove it? Or would I have thought they did remove my sin and would have to wait for the New Testament to tell me, no, it didn't. If it did, then why were the sacrifices repeated? The repetitive nature of the sacrifices daily and yearly shows they did not remove sin because if it did, there would be no need for repetitive sacrifices. But did they know that? Of course they didn't, Michala, because they didn't have Hebrews. It wasn't that they were being deceived. God told them what they needed to know until the fullness of the relation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you want me to interpret for Samuel 3, 14, light of the New Testament, 
it's going to get even worse for them. Are you ready, Charles? It's going to get worse for them if now I take 1 Samuel 3.14 and interpret light of the New Testament. You want to see how bad it gets for these guys and their main man-made tradition? You ready? You want me to show you how bad it gets? I want to make sure Charles is following. Okay. Let's look at Col Colossians 1.16, Charles. And I'm going to ask you a basic question. This is what I challenge James White to debate me on because he'll get decimated by the grace of the triune God. And I'm sorry, it's not anger. It is passion and zeal. And I do have righteous anger towards him. But I'll be very gracious in obliterating him by the grace of the triune God. Colossians 1.16. Charles, read with me. Okay. Read with me. For by him, the Lord Jesus Christ, were all things, tapanta. Take out your Greek New Testament. It's going to be the same language in Greek in verse 16 as in 19 and 20 in a minute. But Charles, follow me. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. So question for you, Charles. When Paul says Christ created all things, tapanta, in heaven, on earth, anything, anything excluded? Or is this inclusive of every created thing in heaven and earth? That the entire heavens and earth and everything in them was created by Christ. Is the language inclusive, exhaustive to include every created thing, right? In heaven, on earth, right? There's no way around it, right? All things in heaven and earth. All things. Now, because of that, Charles, let's go to Colossians 1, 19 and 20. Colossians 1, 19 and 20. I hope this is blessing you guys, edifying you guys, even though I get loud. And again, the Lord knows. Okay, listen. I'm not angry. I speak loud at times because I get filled with passion. No anger here, honestly. So you can use that as an excuse to attack me and bash me, but it just shows how wicked and evil you are. Colossians 1, 19 and 20. Charles, read. For it pleaseth the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Now notice the same language in verse 20 that we just read in 16. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. Same word, tapanta. By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Same language of 16. But he starts from the earth and works, him say, works his way up to heaven. In 16 it was... Heaven, earth, now it's earth to heaven. So now, and he posted it right there. He just posted the Greek. Hati en auto, ektiste ta panta, ta entois oranois, kai ta epites geis, right? Ta orata, kai ta orata, aite thronoi, so on and so forth, right? You see it there? And then verse 20, kai di autu, apa, apo, yep, apo, see, I got to read the Greek over again, apo, Katala Zai. Tapanta is aiton. Aton, aiton. Is aiton. So you see, it's the same in the Greek of 16 and 20. Do you catch it? And I'm giving you the butchering of the Erasmian butchering of the Greek. Did you catch it? Charles, you just admitted when it said all things in heaven and earth means the entire creation. Then in verse 20, in verse 20, when it says all things, things in, in earth and heaven, what's excluded? Did Jesus create all things in heaven and earth? Yes. Did he then reconcile and make peace with the blood of his cross for all things in earth and heaven? Yes. Who's excluded? Now, let me ask you a question, Charles. Do all things in earth also include Eli and his household? Do all things in earth include Eli and his household? In other words, did Jesus create Eli on his, and his household? Because Colossians 1.16 says, by him, by him all things were created in earth. Does that include Eli and his household? 
No, Nathan? I think you're going to get blocked too. Let's try this again, Nathan. In Colossians 1.16, when it says Jesus created all things on earth, was Eli and his household part of the all things that Christ created who happened to be on earth? But then in 20 it says, he made peace by the blood of his cross for all things on earth. Now tell me how you're going to exclude Eli and a household from that. Now I dare you to be honest to God and handle the text reverently and say in verse 20, all things on earth does not include Eli and his household, though they're included in verse 16. Anyone? Nathan, Emma, I dare you to tell me that in 16, when it says Christ created all things on earth, that includes Eli and his household. But when the same language is used in 20, that he reconciled all things to God, making peace by the blood of his cross, things on earth, now Eli and his household are excluded. Nathan, I'm going to try this again before I send you on your merry way. Let's try this again and answer. Let's see if you can be honest to God in Scripture. If all things on earth, in verse 16, excludes nothing from the creative work of Christ, that Christ created everything on earth, contextually, when it says all things were reconciled by Christ on earth, I dare you to tell me that excludes Eli and anyone else you want to exclude. Let's see how honest you're going to be to Scripture before I block you. Go ahead. You see how they can't answer? So are all things reconciled to God? That again shows your ignorance because you don't know the difference between Christ procuring redemption, accomplishing the reconciliation of all things, and that reconciliation being applied. Though he accomplishes it for everyone, it's not applied to everyone because God says you must then believe in what Christ has accomplished. You see that, Nathan Richardson? Yeah. Another filthy Solowitian, total Whitney, a dog of Satan who worships James White. You see how nasty the followers of James White are? The kind of nasty demons and dogs they produce? You think I have it bad? Why don't you ask James White what's happening to his household and why he ran from his church as an elder? I'm having it bad? Okay. Ask him, why did you run from your church as an elder? And what's happening to your family? Yeah. See? See? These are the nasty Solowitians. Why do you think I call his cult followers Solowitians and Totowitians? The man is not healthy because he's a narcissist. He produces this kind of cult following. God forbid, may the Lord convict him and rebuke him and save me and David Wood from producing such people. In Jesus' name, Lord, save us from that. Okay, so Nathan, to, to answer your question, Christ accomplished the reconciliation of all things, but it's not applied until you believe in Christ. That's where James White isn't able to address adequately and drops the ball, and why he has to then resort to rhetoric, appeal to emotion, play to his fan base, deal out, you know, dole out meat. Right? I believe in a perfect Savior perfectly saves. Yeah, that's good for you. We don't care what you think. Okay, so coming back to Charles. Charles, question. If Eli and his household are included in Colossians 1.16, where Paul says Christ created all things on earth, are they not also included in Colossians 1.20, where it says Christ reconciled all things, making peace by the blood of his cross for things on earth. Are they not included? Yeah. Say, so, yeah, I'm angry and jealous. Yes, you're right. Watch what I'm going to do to your idol. Yeah. The dogs are out again. Now, I know, they're dogs. 
He's only going to make it worse for himself because of the people he attracts. Don't worry, watch. Okay. Charles, did you get it? Yes, Reformed Baptist, who ran from his church. I'll go after him on that issue as well, to expose his lies, his lip service. Yeah, and good membership. No, you're not. You're a liar. You surround yourself with yes men. I don't know if Charles got it. Did you get it now, Charles? Okay, folks. Is Eli and his household included in Colossians 1, 16 and 20? Focus, guys. Is he included? Is Eli and his household included Colossians 1, 16 and 20? Okay. So then what happened? Why wasn't atonement applied? Because that's the question <clears throat> that in asking, you're answering. The reason why atonement would not be applied to Eli, it's not because it wasn't made for him. It's because of his, his household's stiff-necked, obstinate rebellion so that what Christ accomplished is not appropriate to them. That's the message of the gospel. Christ died to reconcile you, but that reconciliation is only yours when you turn to him. If not, you remain in your sin. You got another filthy dog of Muhammad. Listen, I know Muhammad was rabied and foamed at his mouth, but you don't have to follow that part of the sunnah. Is that clear now? Did I answer that question, Charles? And we went on a tangent again. If you're going to say, oh, yeah, you're becoming like James White. God forbid, Lord Jesus, save us both. Please don't ask me about him anymore. But it's because he thinks he's a superstar of reform apologetics. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he's going to get dethroned like Trent Horn did. Okay. Is that clear now? Can we move on to other things? Can we move on to other things? Was that clear? Or do you have any questions on particular redemption? I hope I didn't waste my time with you guys, bore you guys, torture you guys with this topic. But Zena, you understood why nothing they quote proves that Jesus died only for the elect? It sounds impressive until you come and question them and dig deeper and further. Is it clear? Pray that God will give me the grace to constrain myself so that right away when we have a nuisance, a dog of Satan, an agent of Satan, just block them, not waste energy on them. Because I don't want the detractors to use this against me. Because you know, it is, they can't refute me exegetically, so they're going to attack my character. Glenn, I, didn't really, I don't really care what you think God did. And Glenn, because of that, you got to leave. Send Glenn on their merry way. Okay, if there's no other questions on limited atonement, then we'll go into another topic. Andrew, I hope you're not getting upset with me, friend. Right. Well, any teaching can be misused and misappropriated. So you guys now are ready to respond to 1 Samuel 3.14, right? If someone misquotes 1 Samuel 3.14 saying, see... Atonement isn't made for everyone. You know how to respond to that, right? All right, what's the question? God, have mercy on all of us in Jesus' name and forgive us and be patient with us. Please, my God, follow us in spirit. In Jesus name. What's the question, Michala? Yep, exactly. Here's a Mohammedan dog of, of Muhammad who's trying to pretend he's friends with James White. Come on, admins. You got to be faster. These demons come under different nicks. Come on. No, you're asking me, do you have to be baptized in water to be saved? I'm not of that tradition. Of course not. I'm not of that tradition. 
I don't believe you have to be baptized in water to be saved. So no, don't ask me that question because I'm not of that tradition. I believe you're saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, which you receive as a gift through faith in him, trusting in him. Sam, I really like how you explain. Okay, all right. No questions on this because I want to move to other things, things that are going to be productive and fruitful and not burdensome and tiresome. No, no other questions on this? We'll go into other things that are fruitful, right? Anything? Going once? Going twice? No sale. Let me do a future session on that, Zena. I want to talk about Matthew 28, 18. Okay, Matthew 28, 18. I hope the it's good anyway. Let's go to Matthew 28, 18. This was brought up to me. How can Jesus be God if he's given all authority in heaven and earth? Matthew 28, 18. Let's break that down. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power, ksusia, can also mean all authority, is given unto me in heaven and on earth. All power has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Did you see what the Lord Jesus said? You see what the Lord Jesus said? All power is given unto him. Do you understand now? Now, the objection. No, Alex, that would be a contradiction in terms. If he ha if he's all-powerful, then he receives no power. He already has it. So, Alex, that's turning the objection on its head. If Jesus is God, he already possesses all power. Why would he need to be given all power? Let me repeat the objection. Guys, pay attention now because I want to show you how to respond to this. If Jesus is God, why would he need to be given all power, meaning all authority, all rule, all sovereignty over all creation? Heaven and earth means he has supreme sovereign authority over all creation. All creation is subject to him. Okay, All creation is subject to him. But if he is God, doesn't he already have supreme authority over creation? Why would he need to be given all authority? Right? You understand the objection? You understand the objection, folks? But it is given to him. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Christ. If he is God, he already possesses supreme power and authority. He already is sovereign over heaven and earth. Why would it be needed to be given to him? If you understand the objection, I can then show you how to respond, depending on who's asking, who's raising the objection. Are we ready? None of you guys are answering the objection. Just to let you know that. He's the second person of the Trinity. Why would the second person of the Trinity, if he's equal to the Father and the Holy Spirit in authority, be given authority when he had already possessed it by virtue of being God? He's still not addressing the objection. Daryl Nutt. What do I do with this guy? He's a guy that he keeps pressing me and sending me emails about this passage and he wants to chime in and tell me that king james says all power are you insulting me now daryl not is that what you're doing let me repeat it again daryl not the word power even in the king james means authority the word power in the king james means authority sovereignty even in the king james the way it uses the greek word exousia no, it was his question. Now I want to block him because I don't want him to hear the, the answer. Because he just comes in at the last minute and chimes in. And you called me to teach? I can't do this. I don't have the patience. I'm not James White. I don't have the patience. Are we going to answer the question? Or are we going to sit here? And look at each other and get each other animated so that by the time I'm done with my YouTube channel, it's just going to be me and Protestant showing up to hear me speak to Protestant and Protestant post verses for me. Are we ready for the answer or no? Are we ready? And Zena likes it when I get passionate, I get angry, I get loud, I get rude because, you know, typical Assyrian. 
She was birthed in, in controversy, birthed in fighting and debate. Even when she was born, her mother and father were having a fight and a debate over her birth. Right? What did you do, woman? Wasn't me, it was you. Okay. This is all a test. I know, Andrew, it is, right? In Jesus' name, I'll overcome, I'll conquer. Let's try this again. Let's try this again. Are we ready now? All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Are you ready now? For the answer. Are you ready now for the answer? Okay. Depending on who's asking you or raising this objection, you're going to answer the objection, but then you're going to learn how to turn it against them. If it's a Muslim, I'm going to show you how to turn the objection against the Muslim. But for now, let me answer it. Let's see why the Lord Jesus Christ could say all power, meaning all sovereign rule, all sovereign authority, kingly rule, royal power over entire creation has been given to me. In other words, the entire creation is subject to me as I rule it as king. It's not about royal power, sovereign rulership, sovereignty over the entire creation. Okay, are you now ready for the answer? Are we ready for the answer? Let's see if you guys are ready in Jesus' name. Sorry to torture you. That's why my views are going down. Matthew 12, 17 to 21, specifically verse 18. Matthew 12, 17 to 21, specifically verse 18. Here's why. Here is why. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Esau the prophet, saying, Behold my servant. Behold my servant. Jesus comes to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah that he is the servant of the Father. He comes to the world, becomes flesh, in order to take the status, the position of a servant to God the Father. As a servant, he's laid aside his kingly prerogatives, his sovereign privileges, put it aside to become a servant, a slave of the Father on earth. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. The reason why Jesus could be given royal power Sovereign authority, kingly, kingly rule over all creation is because he deliberately came to the earth to become a servant, a slave of the father to fulfill the prophecy that says he comes to be the father's servant on earth. Okay, Matthew 20, 28. Matthew 20, 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So, real easy answer. Why would it shock you that after Jesus perfectly accomplishes the will of the Father on earth, which is to live the perfect, obedient life to the Father's will, a will that included that he would die voluntarily on the cross for our sins, and be raised back to in that physical body, now made immortal, indestructible, that after he's accomplished all that, he would receive royal power to rule creation again when part of God's will was for him to come to the earth as a servant, thereby voluntarily setting aside his kingly rule and privileges. I have no idea what Andrew is asking me, so I'm going to ignore it. Are you with me there? Unless you're saying that cult leaders abuse, violate, oppress their members, make them slave over them, 
and even take the female members and rape them at will, saying it's God's will. Whereas Jesus Christ made himself nothing, humbled himself to the point of washing the dirty feet of his disciples, including Judas, his betrayer, allowing sinners to beat him to a bloody pulp, whip him to the point of death, nailing him with spikes on a cross, gasping for air, dying a shameful, excruciating death, one of the most shameful, painful ways to die, and having nothing on earth to claim as his own. Is that clear? Okay. So now, Daryl Nutty, did you get your answer? Why Jesus would be given power to rule over heaven on earth after his resurrection? Did you get the answer? I don't care what they told you. Did you get the answer? I know that, Billy. I know he was being rhetorical, but I didn't know why he asked me at this specific point. But then it dawned on me. He wanted me to show the greatness, the beauty, the majesty, the humbleness, humility of Jesus, unlike other religious figures and cult leaders who use religion as a tool to oppress, dominate, and control. Right? So, Daryl Nutty, did you get the answer, brother? Please. I'll be stuck in circular argument. I have no idea what you mean, bro. I think I'm wasting your time because I have no idea what you're talking about. And I think I'd be doing you a service if I send you to someone else so you can learn from them. Because you constantly do this, send me emails. And when I then forward articles or give you responses, you still don't get it. And I think I'm wasting your time, brother. What do you think? Why would you be going in circles? Let me let me test you out because I think your 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 life here is going to be short lived on my YouTube channel. Why would you be going in circles, brother? Don't make me more than I am. I'm nothing. Make James White more than he is. Why would you be going in circles, brother? Everyone got it. I don't know why you'd be going in circles. Real quickly. From now on, I'm going to be tight tightening the reins on the ship. As soon as I get someone who's going to attack and mock, won't even address them, will block them by the grace of God. And people who just can't follow, I'm going to be <clears throat> courteous and gracious to send them somewhere else. Because like I said, you may learn more effectively by listening to someone else. What does Jesus not having power got to do with the fact that the power he did not have is kingly power? Kingly power. What does him not having power on earth have to do with the power that he's talking about in Matthew 28, 18? It's kingly power, royal power, royal authority. No, Michala, please don't chime in. He wasn't given authority because he's the perfect human. Please, sister, don't help me. Daryl Nutt, let me try it again with you. What does Jesus not having power on earth got to do with the plain reading of Matthew 28 that it's talking about kingly power, not omnipotence? LOL, because I'm about to block you in 10 seconds. You think I'm kidding? No, you didn't get it. You're just saying this. Let's try it a fifth time. Sorry, guys. I don't mean to burn you guys, but this is why you see I separate the wheat from the chaff and I block people because it's not only distracting me. When I'm distracted, I distract you, and a lot of people get upset, don't come back. Forgive me. Be, bear with me because I'm trying to teach people who come how to learn from these sessions, and if they're not getting it, go somewhere else. What does the Unitarian claim that Jesus has no power on earth have to do with the use of Jesus' word in Matthew 28, 18? A context in which when Jesus says all power, he doesn't mean omnipotence. He means royal power, sovereign authority. I just repeated it about 15 times. No, as in I did, but Daryl Nutt spends more time listening to heretics, and he wonders why he's confused, and I'm going to send him on his merry way. Because when you have a gentleman that spends just as much time hearing objections against his faith, 
He'll never be able to understand what the faith is because he's got the thousand objections in his mind and it keeps creating confusion and chaos until he apostatizes and loses his faith. You with me there? And he does it all the time. Because if I show you all the questions, there isn't a time he hasn't sent me questions that I thought he would have found answers to because I gave him links to my articles and they're all there because it means he's spending more time listening to the heretics, less time studying the arguments so he can learn. That means this man, it's a matter of time, he falls away. Any, anyone take bets? This man, in a matter of time, will fall away? Can I explain to you? I want to take, use this as a teaching moment. Let me use this as a teaching moment, not just scripture. If, for example, I tell you guys, listen, I tell you guys, look, here are the links to my articles. I have 200 articles that deal with these uh, subjects. Take the time to prayerfully study them. And you keep coming back to me with objections by anti-Trinitarians that I've already thoroughly addressed in the rebuttals. Isn't that a clear sign? You're not reading the materials to learn. You keep listening to the heretics, which is rocking your faith. Am I wrong? Tell me where I'm wrong in my discernment. So I want, I want this as a teaching moment. Tell me where I'm wrong in my discernment. Can someone tell me where I'm wrong? Anybody? I have at least four to five articles on Matthew 28, 18. I have at least four to five articles on Matthew 28, 18. Did you know that? At least four to five. Okay. And the meaning of Matthew 28 is royal power, exercising sovereign authority and rulership over the heavens and the earth. That Jesus is saying, I'm the king of creation, and all the nations must be subject to me. Why do you think he goes on in that same chapter to say, in that same chapter to say, make disciples of all nations? Do you understand what the context is, right? The king of creation, the king of the nations has been crowned. He's been coronated. Now he demands the allegiance of his subjects. And he just admit to you, he didn't read my articles, you see? You with me there? Did everyone get it? I'm taking this to teach you. So don't be bothered because I'm trying to teach you. Are you getting it? All right. he, you, you see, he just admit he didn't read them. He didn't read them. Did you see? He just admitted so my discernment was right. He just admitted. My discernment was right. Although I sent the links to him several weeks ago, he hasn't even bothered to read. Now, not only is he disrespecting me and my time, he's disrespecting you and your time, but he's disrespecting the Lord. When I told him the material is there, study. Right? For the rest of you who've been listening, for the rest of you who've been listening, did you see why Jesus could be given such power? Because in the context, it's talking about his royal power, his kingly power, his power as king, meaning authority. Authority, right? Did you get that? Did you get that? Authority, right? Did anyone, who didn't get it besides this guy? Because I want to ignore him now. I want to make sure the rest of you got it. That in the context, Jesus is saying, all power, i.e. sovereign authority, royal authority, kingly rule has been given to me. I now rule all creation. It's mine. Now, with that said, with that said, Zina and everyone else, why would Jesus be given royal authority kingly rule, power to reign, if as God, he already is king of creation? What was the answer? For those of you listening, what was the answer? 
If he's God, he's already king. Why would God, the king of creation, be given authority to rule? What was the answer from Matthew? What was the answer from Matthew? What was the answer? Thank you, Serrated. You just blessed me and made me happy. Serrated answer. No, Zena, you didn't get it either. And it hurts me that you're certain you didn't get it. Get it. No. What does humanity have to do with the two passages I just spent breaking down and you didn't get it? Serrata, you got it. You blessed me. And Lopez came in lately and answered incorrectly. Okay. Serrata, serrated spork, thank you. You just gave me hope for humanity. He answered. Well, answer. Let's see. What prophecy? Thank you, Alex. You blessed me too. Pangarine, you blessed me. Okay. First, last, you got me. See, this is why sometimes I honestly feel, I'm going to be honest with you. Am I really wasting my time? Because I took about 10 minutes to answer the question. And we looked at two passages in Matthew. And not everyone gets it. Why? But most of you did. Which part of Matthew 12, 18 wasn't clear? That Jesus fulfilled the prophecy spoken through Esaias the prophet. Behold my servant. Behold my servant. Which part of Matthew 20, 28 wasn't clear? Matthew 20, 28 wasn't clear. By the way, should I keep this or should I delete this video afterwards? No. Jesus could assume a servant role without becoming human. But that's how he chose to become a servant, by becoming human. Matthew 20, 28. Read it. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Okay. Did we get it now? Did we get it now? Did we get it now? Did we get it? Let's see if Zena got it. Why would Jesus, if he's God, be given royal authority to rule over creation? Because as God, he's already king of creation. Let's see if Zena got it. She was too excited in me bashing people for her to listen. Okay, so then now that he fulfilled his role as a servant, why would it surprise you that as a servant, he set aside his royal prerogatives, his kingly privileges, set it aside to become a servant, and then afterwards regain his sovereign right to rule? Should that surprise you or that's what you should expect? Exactly, Roberto Al Pacino. It's intertextual. In light of the fact he became a servant, should it be surprising that the Father, in response to Jesus' voluntary act humbling himself, the Father then graciously responds to what his son did, saying, Here, son, here is your kingdom well, that was yours by right, but which you set aside. You understand what he's doing? He is voluntarily humbling himself before the father to be the father's servant. And the father then, in love, responds to that act of humility, that act of humbleness by saying, here you go, son. Here's the kingdom that you voluntarily set aside in order to honor me by becoming my servant, though you're more than that. You're my son and king. Here it is. Here's your kingdom to, back to you again. Is that clear? Everyone got it? That's how you answer the humanitarian pseudo-Christian son of Satan who's not a true Christian but a perverter of scripture if he brings it up. Now, if a Muslim brings it up, 
If a Muslim brings it up, can I show you how to turn this against the Muslim? Thank you, Roberto. Can I now show you how to turn Matthew 28, 18 against the Muslim? If a Muslim brings it up, now not only do you answer the way I said, I answered it now. What's your problem now, Muslim? You may not accept that Jesus is God who humble himself, but I don't care what you accept. You quoted Matthew, you're stuck with Matthew. Matthew gives you the answer. So don't quote a part of Matthew and ignore Matthew's own explanation of why Jesus, though God who became flesh, could receive a kingdom that was his, which he voluntarily set aside. But now turn it against him or her. Are you ready now? Are you now ready to turn it against the Muslim to show Muhammad is a false prophet, Allah is a false God, and the Quran is a work of Satan? Are you ready? Who's ready? Okay. Remember the argument. Jesus can't be God if he's given a kingdom, right? If Jesus receives a kingdom, he can't be God, right? That's the argument. Jesus can't be God if someone gives him something because God by nature possesses everything. He doesn't need anyone to give him a single thing. That's the argument, right? All right. First, last, I'm going to need your Quran unless Protestant can post Quranic verses. Either one of you post Quranic verses. Chapter 15, verse 23. You sure you're ready? You sure you're listening? You sure you're you're seated? You know you're 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 seated tight on the saddle and give me your undivided attention. Okay, first here's Quran, chapter 15, verse 23. Quran, chapter 15, verse 23. Listen, lo, it is we, even we. Who quicken and give death, and we are the inheritors. Oh, you didn't catch it. Post it again. Allah supposedly speaking in the Quran. Allah tells Muhammad and his followers, We are the ones who inherit. We are inheritors. Allah inherits from whom? I thought God, by definition, already owns everything. He can't be given anything. So why does your God receive an inheritance? He's an inheritor of whom? To whom? I don't care who the we is. Focus. Chapter 19, verse 40 of the Quran. Chapter 19, verse 40. Oh, this guy. Lo, we, only we, inherit the earth and all who are thereon, and unto us they are returned. Wait, 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 wait. Post it again. 1940. Post it again. Allah supposedly speaking again to and through Muhammad. Lo, we, only we, inherit the earth and all who are thereon, unto us they are returned. Wait, Allah. How can you inherit the earth? I, heard, I thought the earth already belongs to you. I thought as God, you own everything. You own the earth. But now you're saying... You will inherit the earth and everyone on it. How can you inherit the earth and what's on it if it already belongs to you because you're God? But Bill Mandley, I don't care about the we. See, you guys are not listening again. This is where I get frustrated and I love you guys. Who cares about the we? That's not the argument. The argument is the inheritance. If it's we, me, he, she. That's irrelevant. What has the plural got to do with the plain reading? Allah inherits. Hello, earth calling Orson. Come in, Orson. Why are you focused on the wrong part of the argument? Any Christians help me understand? He, she, me, we. Who cares about the pronoun? Why are you guys making a big deal of the pronoun? What's the argument? Let's see if you caught it. Let's see if you caught it. I don't think you caught it. What's the argument in these passages? What's the argument in these passages? What's the argument? Why am I using these passages? Let's see who's getting it. If you don't get it, I am wasting my time. Okay. 
Thank you. You got it. Remember the argument against Jesus. If Jesus is God, he's our the king of creation. He already possesses absolute sovereignty over creation. How can someone give it to him? That's proof he's not God. Okay. If Allah's God, he already owns everything. Heaven and earth are his. How then can Allah say in the Quran, I inherit the earth and everyone on the earth. I'm an inheritor. He's supposed to be God. He inherits nothing. So according to your argument, Allah can't be God. Therefore, toss out the Quran. Stop worshiping Allah. Did you get the argument now? You see how I now turn the argument against the Muslim. But notice what I did, though. I answered the objection. So as Christians who love Jesus and love his word, answer the objection, refute the objection, and turn it against them. Something that, unfortunately, I'm going to mention him again, James White miserably fails in doing, which is why his debates with Muslims are not that effective. Either change or stop. Don't make our job harder. Chapter 19, verse 83. Chapter 19, verse 83. Seest thou not that we have said, I'm sorry, 1980. See, I was thinking of Allah and demons because Allah is a demon. 1980, not 1983. 1983 goes with 6 1 12. 1980. And Roberto, you know you need to go, right? Send him on his merry way. Send our friend bye bye. 1980. And we shall inherit from him that whereof he spake, and he will come unto us alone without his wealth and children. We shall inherit from him that whereof he spake. So we're going to inherit it from him. Okay. The third passage that says Allah inherits the earth and inherits from his creatures. Allah's creatures give Allah his inheritance. 21 verse 89. 21 verse 89. And Zachariah, when he cried unto his Lord, My Lord, leave me not childless, though thou art the best of inheritors. Here's how you know Allah actually inherits. That's why I sent this guy in his merry way, because another chief who wants to pontificate. Notice Allah is, a, is part of a group. There's a group of people who inherit. Allah is among them, but he's the best of them. You are the best of those who inherit. You're the best of inheritors. So Allah belongs to a group of people who inherit. He's an inheritor like them, but he's the best among them. Did you catch it? Exactly, first last. Allah's the best among those who deceive. No deceiver better than him. He's the best of all deceivers. There's a group of liars, deceivers. Allah's the best. There's a group of inheritors. Allah's among them. He's the best of them. 2189. In fact, do you know what one of the names of Allah happens to be? In all the lists of names of Allah, you know what one of his names happened to be? One of his names happened to be? The Lord Jesus heal you. The Lord Jesus wash you, prof. Fill you with the Holy Spirit and give you coolness in Jesus' name. One of the names of Allah is El. Warith. El Warith. L A L the Warith. W A R T H. The inheritor, the heir. That's one of the 99 names of Allah. In every list of names of Allah, one of them is El Warith. Now understand, this is now going to prove that Jesus Christ, our Lord, is God. Notice Islamic theology in the Quran agrees. Allah is the heir, the inheritor. That's one of the names of Allah that cannot be given to a creature. In Islamic theology, the names of Allah belong to him and cannot be given to a creature. So if he's al warid the heir, the inheritor, you can't ascribe it to a creature, right? But hold on. Let's see what the Lord Jesus Christ says of himself. Let's go to Mark 12, verse 7. Matthew 21, 38. Mark 12, verse 7. Mark 12, verse 7, Matthew 21, verse 38, Luke 20, 14. Luke 20, 14, 
Matthew 21, 38, Mark 12, verse 7. Watch here. Jesus speaking. Folks, this is the parable of the tenants. Jesus is speaking. Jesus is speaking. Notice what Jesus says of himself. But those husbands said among themselves, this is the heir. Jesus just said that the Jews realized he, Jesus, is el -wadith. This is the heir. Right? Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. Repeated by Matthew in Matthew 21, 38, Luke 20, 14. But when the husbands, husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. Luke 20, verse 14. Jesus is the one narrating this parable. Jesus is the one quoting the people, calling him the son who is el Wadith, the heir. Luke 20, 14. But when the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. What is Jesus doing, claiming to be the son who is el Wadith, the heir, when Jesus is supposed to be a Muslim, and he would know as a Muslim that el Wadith is a title of God alone. See what I just did? You see what I just did? I not only answered the objection, I now turned the objection against the anti-Trinitarian heretic to decimate their false religion, their assaults against the triune God. This is why I'm going to say it again. Folks, if you come here with a gracious, humble attitude, not challenging me, not arguing with me, not fighting with me, prayerfully ask the Spirit to protect you from error and correct me when I'm mistaken. Hear what I have to say. Take notes. Re-listen to the broadcast. Study them carefully. And if you see something I'm wrong, reject it. And that which you believe is right, use it and spread it for the glory of Christ. I promise you, by the grace of the triumph God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will not be refuted by the cults, the anti-Trinitarians. They won't be able to do it because you have the truth and now know the truth and can articulate the truth. Now live the truth and love the truth and die for the truth because the triumph God is the truth. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But that is going to get worse. I'm still not done turning in against the Muslim. Are you ready? I'm still not done turning it against the Muslim. Are you ready? So pray that a Muslim uses this against you. I'm still not done turning it against the Muslim. You ready now? Chapter 25, verse 2 of the Quran. Chapter 25, verse 2 of the Quran. Yep, well, I'm not done yet. I think we had a very intense, in-depth Meaty session by the grace of the triumph God. In spite of the distractions, it was intense, in-depth, and meaty, though I'm down to 75. I'm about to cry. 25 verse 2, let's read. He unto whom belongeth the sovereignty of the heavens and the earth. He hath chosen no son, nor hath he any partner in the sovereignty. He hath created everything and hath meted out for the measure. Now notice what the Quran said. The sovereignty of the heavens and the earth belongs to Allah. He has no son and has no partner in his sovereignty. Did you catch it? According to the Quran, Allah has no part partner in his sovereign rule over heaven and earth and has no son who shares in his sovereign rule over heaven and earth. Remember, Jesus is supposed to be a Muslim. And according to Tawheed al-Rububiyya, Tawheed al-Rububiyya, Tawheed al-Rububiyya, I'm repeating it three times. Allah is the sole ruler of the heavens and earth, and he will now allow no creature to share in his lordship sovereignty over heaven and earth. Wait, Matthew 28, 18 already decimates it because Jesus says in Matthew 28, 18, all authority and power in heaven and earth is mine. Why would Allah give Jesus absolute sovereign power over all creation thereby allowing Jesus to share in his rule over all creation when the Quran says Allah doesn't do it for anyone.
So you see how Matthew 28, 18 already proves Muhammad is a liar, an antichrist, and Allah a false god? But it gets better. What about Matthew 28, 19? Matthew 28, 19. You guys learning? Zine, everyone learning? Paying attention? Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name, singular, of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Ghost. Whoa, wait, 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 wait. Not only does Jesus say, all authority, sovereign rule over heaven and earth has been given to me, so I share in God's rule over all creation, something Quran says, Allah will not permit any creature to do. The very next verse, Jesus says, God is the Father and I am the Son. But the Quran says, Allah is not a father. Jesus isn't the son. Chapter 5, verse 18 of the Quran. Write this down. We're not going to look at it. Chapter 5, verse 18 of the Quran. Chapter 9, verse 30 of the Quran. Chapter 9, verse 30 of the Quran. Chapter 19, verses 88 to 93 of the Quran. Chapter 19, verses 88 to 93 of the Quran. Chapter 21, verse 26 of the Quran. Chapter 39, verse 4 of the Quran. Chapter 39, verse 4 of the Quran. Chapter 72, verse 3 of the Quran, among a host of others, saying, Allah is a father to no one. Jesus isn't his son. Jews and Christians are not his children. All you can be is a slave to master. Allah is the master. You're the slave. And yet here Jesus says, all sovereignty over all creation is mine. I share it with the father as his son, which contradicts the Quran. How dare you, Muslim, quote Matthew 28 to refute the Trinity, when Matthew 28 proves Muhammad is a son of Satan, an antichrist, and your God is a false God. And by the way, Andrew Martin, all glory to the triumph God, all glory to the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, who fills us for their glory, for the glory of Jesus, the Father's beloved. All of this is from memory in Jesus' name. And may he perfect these gifts in me to use it. To mesmerize people how real Jesus is and how much he loves us. From memory. I don't have notes. I want him to get the glory. And you see why I'm under attack. But you guys are going to pray and fast with me and Daryl Nutty. Now you're going to take my rebuke and chastening to heart. Read my materials. It's there, the answers. Everything I told you has been in the articles for the past 10 years, brother. AnsweringIslam.net. Look for Sam Shimon. I got two pages, an older page and a, a newer page with a new format, and then links to specific authors that I'm rebutting. Look for my links, rebutting Paul Williams and Shibri Ali. It's all there by the grace of the triumph God, for the glory of the triumph God, as the Spirit fills us and fills me to glorify Jesus unto death and forever. Man, I'm on fire today. Thank God. I feel it. Right? Now, I'm going to give you icing on the cake, Daryl Nutty, to refute these Unitarian heretics by using Matthew 28, 20. Are you ready? Matthew 28, 20. Now, we're going to go back to the so-called Christian Unitarians who are nothing but Bible perverts and sons of Satan. Matthew 28, 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have, I have blah, 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 whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Daryl Nutt, I'm going to need your feedback, everyone else. Pay attention now. Listen, because we're going to have to end it real soon, because it's been over two hours. Okay. Are you ready? Are you ready to listen? Jesus says in the context of sending his disciples throughout the whole world to make disciples of all nations that he will personally be with every one of them. Not physically. He's not physically with us, but personally he'll be with all of us, all of them. Now, in the context, Jesus is promising that you don't have to worry about being successful in your mission. Pay attention. You will accomplish the mission that I have given to you. Why? Because I'm going to be with all of you to oversee the success of your mission. No matter how many of you are, no matter where you're at, 
You will not fail in making disciples of all nations because I am with every one of you to guarantee the success of your mission. Question for Daryl and everyone else. What kind of attributes must Jesus possess in order to be with every disciple, personally present with all of them, to then guarantee they will succeed in the mission, preventing any power from stopping them from accomplishing his will? Only omnipresence. He's going to be present with them to make sure they don't fail. Omnipotence. Okay, wait. So you're telling me that in verse 20, Jesus claims to be omnipresent because the entire creation is present before him, all-powerful because there is no power that can prevent him from empowering his disciples, guaranteeing the absolute success of their mission. And you're going to use Matthew 20 and 18 to prove that Jesus isn't God. Really? That's what you're going to use Matthew 28, 18 to prove and ignore verse 20? But wait, it gets better. It gets better, Daryl. You need to pay attention. And I've done sessions on this and I have articles on this. There is a literary feature, a literary device known as bookend or inclusio. Guys, pay attention. Inclusio or bookend. This is a literary feature that scholars have noticed is found throughout the Bible where you have an author ending his book by reiterating, repeating the very point he made at the start of his book. Okay? In other words, the author concludes by reiterating a theme or a point that he began with, right? That's known as a bookend or inclusio. I'm going to ask you to pray about that. I'm going to ask you, Andrew, it's funny you mentioned that. I'm going to ask you to pray about that. Okay, now, okay, now, why is that important? Matthew ends the gospel by having Jesus make the same point that Matthew began at the start of the gospel. What do I mean? Let's post Matthew 28, 20, back to back with Matthew 1, 22 to 23. And at this, Daryl Nutt, if you don't get the answer to your objection, I'm done with you for at least a week, and then I'll bring you back. For the sake of Jesus, may the Lord give me the grace to be patient with my brothers and sisters as I want him to be patient with me. Okay, Matthew 28, 20. Matthew 1, 22 to 23. Pay attention, Daryl, everyone else. At least it's only going to be a week, brother. Not definitely. Pay attention. Listen. Watch the bookend. And lo, I am with you. All way, even unto the end of the world. Amen. I, I personally. Now let's read Matthew 1, 22, 23, Daryl Nutt. Pay attention, Daryl. Matthew ends the gospel by the way he began it. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Now you know what's beautiful about the Greek? The Greek says, Ha theos, the God has come to be with us. I don't think you got it. Matthew ends the gospel by reiterating, repeating the point he made at the start. And what did he say at the start? Jesus's conception and birth from the Blessed Virgin is the fulfillment that he is God with us. And that's why Jesus ends the gospel by reassuring us he remains with us. Basically, Jesus is saying, I'm the God who has come to dwell with you and remain with you to the end of the age. But the words in Greek is, Jesus is the God, ha theos, who's with us. Wow. There's the link to the Greek. You can see it. Who didn't get it? Matthew begins by saying, Jesus' conception and birth from the virgin by the power of the Spirit, she conceived and gave birth to him as a sexual virgin, is to fulfill that he is the God who comes to dwell with us, which is why Jesus then ends the gospel with the words, I am with you. I am the God who has come to dwell with you, and I am with you till the end of the age. 
So Jesus, you're Hathias, the God? Yes. That's who you are, according to Matthew? Yes. You got it, Garu. So, Daryl Nutt, how are you allowing these Unitarian, heretic, snake, sons of Satan get away with butchering Matthew 28, 18? But it gets better. Let's end it with Matthew 1, 21. Matthew 1, 21. And we're done for tonight's session. It's been over two hours. And she shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, the angel explains, pay attention now, the angel explains why Joseph is to call him Jesus. Notice the explanation. Guys, you need to listen. Please. I want to make sure you get it. Please. I want you to get it. I want you to know your faith. I want you to know the Bible. I want you to know God and fall more passionately with him and proclaim his glory by living for him and preaching. Okay. He says, you're going to call him Jesus for this reason. For this reason. The reason why you're going to call his name Jesus is because he, Jesus, will... If you don't see, if you don't know what Jesus means, you won't make the connection. The word Jesus in Hebrew is Yeshua. Yeshua is a short form of Yehoshua. Yeshua literally means Yahovah is salvation. So this is what the angel is saying. This is what the angel is saying. Guys, pay attention. Call him Yeshua, which means Jehovah is salvation because he comes to save his people from their sins. In other words, Jesus' name tells us who he is and why he is able to do what he does. Who is he? Jehovah who comes to save. Because Yeshua means Jehovah is salvation. Call him Jehovah's salvation, which is why he comes to save his people from their sins. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, Mr. Angel? Yes? Mr. Angel? How can Jesus save anyone from their sins when the Old Testament says Jehovah and Jehovah alone saves from sins? And Jehovah alone saves Israel, his people, from their sins. Psalm 130, 7 to 8. Psalm 130, verses 7 to 8. Psalm 130, 7 to 8. And put it back to back with Matthew 121. Psalm 130, 7 to 8, back to back with Matthew 121. Let Israel hope in the Lord, Jehovah, Yehovah. For with Jehovah, Yehovah, there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. Notice verse 8. And he, Jehovah, shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. But wait. Matthew 1, the angel says, And she, Mary, shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for Jesus shall save his people from their sins. Man, I'm confused. Uh, Matthew, yeah. Psalm 130 says, Jehovah is the God who saves Israel, saves his people from their iniquities. Yeah? Then why have the virgin-born son called Jesus, which means Jehovah's salvation, and then say it's this virgin-born son who actually saves his people from their sins, something that the psalm says is what Jehovah does. Did you guys hear that or no? Did you hear that or no? I repeat. Matthew, the angel tells Joseph, when the virgin gives birth to her son as a virgin, call his name Jesus because he saves his people from their sins. Jesus means Jehovah's salvation. Call the child Jehovah's salvation because it's the child who will personally save his people from their sins. Yeah? Why would the angel say that, Matthew? Why would he be called Jehovah's salvation and do what only Jehovah does? 
save people from their sins. When I just read Psalm 130, it says it's Jehovah who saves Israel from Israel's sins, and Israel is Jehovah's people. Why would that be applied to Jesus? Because he's God with us, because he's Jehovah who is salvation. So wait, Matthew, you're telling me Jesus is Jehovah who became flesh, Jehovah born as a babe. The baby born is Jehovah being born as a baby, the almighty God of heaven. Jehovah, the God, is now born as a baby, and his name is Jesus of Nazareth? Yeah, that's what I'm telling you. Hmm. Did it make sense? Who cares whether I pay attention or not? Because it's still going to get blurry, Lena. I know you can't get enough of my handsome face, but it's okay, Lena. I hope that's clear. See, it's blurry again. Is that clear? Stop, Lena. I'm a spoken man. I'm taken. Guard your heart, sister. Daryl Nutt, if after today you tell me how to answer the passages that say Jesus was given power and authority, I'm going to send you to Calvinville. Is that clear? Everyone got it now? Okay, guys, pray now. I need you to still pray, and if you can't, even fast for me. Pray. God plants me where I'm at permanently, gives me favor with the powers that be, that they'll favor me, work with me, and I stay here. Pray I get a place soon because my other brother's coming. We're going to get a place together. Pray God provide for me generously to take care of my girls and myself to do ministry. Pray for my health to get healthier. Pray I get holier and become more like Jesus, more in love with Jesus, more in love with you for the sake of Jesus and live more faithfully. Pray for our daily needs. And also, I've been praying for God's will to be done, to be done in my life regarding companionship. And for the life of me, for the past, I think, year, I think God has spoken to me. There is a particular person. Pray for supernatural confirmation that I get it sooner than later so that I don't deceive myself but i'm quite certain this is the one and i just have to wait so can you pray for that i'd appreciate because i want god's will i don't want to make a mistake again and i really sense the lord is telling me this is the one wait even though there are times i just want to walk away paypal you just got to use my email so can you pray for those things for me yes god willing i'll be on tomorrow look for me around the afternoon Zina, if there's any solace, she's a Syrian. Shh, say nothing. Okay? So keep praying for me, guys. And if it's not God's will, then just remove it from my heart. But it's very strong in my heart, and I really believe it's because the Lord's telling me, this is the one, and be patient. His will be done. He knows what's best. And I know he'll protect me and will not allow me to fall into snares anymore. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah, the God of heaven. As a babe from the Blessed Virgin to be with us and remains with us till the end of the age. May he come sooner than later. Modern Atha. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. You are the Father's heart, his beloved, our God and Savior. Fill us with the Spirit. Seal us by the Spirit. Save us from the world, from Satan and our flesh. Save my daughters and bless them. And plant me here for your glory. And make it clear to that other person what your will is. We love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Christ is risen, risen indeed. See you tomorrow, God willing.